Uh, welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Alexey Starovoitov. I work for Facebook. Uh, together with Daniel Borkman from Kavalent, I maintain BPF uh, subsystem in the Linux kernel. By the show of hands, how many people here have never heard of BPF until today? Have not, have not heard. Okay, this presentation for you as well. <laughs> no, seriously, uh, this is for uh, everyone. Uh, I will go from the past, uh, how, it, how it began quickly, into uh, what shape BPF takes, uh, takes today, and we'll give a glimpse of uh, where we're going uh, this year and in the future. First of all, it's uh, the most important to understand what are the goals and non-goals for BPF as a whole. So first of all, uh, it's a way to, first of all, safely and easily uh, modify kernel behavior. Safety was in the BPF from the start. It's kind of baked in in the architecture, and I think we did a pretty good job uh, keeping the safety in check. Uh, there were, of course, a few bugs over the years, but uh, I think it actually worked pretty well. The easily part on the other side didn't work quite so well. So. BPF is hard to use, is uh, uh, number one complaint we hear all the time, and that's what we try and address uh, pretty much nonstop. Non-goals are equally important. When we just push, started to push in patches into the kernel back in uh, four plus years ago, people were saying, oh, you're trying to do detrace in the kernel. That's what you're about. You introduce a dynamic tracing of the into the kernel. If you're doing so, why don't you use a different virtual machine like Dtrace used in Solaris or like KTAP did? Then uh, networking folks saying, oh no, the VPF is actually there to replace a VS or it is uh, to replace the IP table. So this constant fight for the turf was like from the day one because people misunderstood what BPF is trying to achieve. Yes, you can do dynamic tracing. Yes, you can do just as uh, uh, full kernel introspection with a BPF, but that's, that's a non-goal for the, for the architecture and for instruction set as a whole. To look back, uh, how we started. So long days ago when uh, BPF one was introduced, the classic one by Von Jacobson, it, was pretty cool back then, but it had uh, only two shapes. Uh, whether you can use it as a truck or as a, as a robot. Uh, a truck would be something that was filtering the packet through the pickup interface, and the robot uh, was the SECOM filtering. Both are cool, and uh, SECOM was still uh, heavily used, but only of two forms. That was the underlying restriction of architecture, like speaking, speaking for themselves. The classic BPF was designed with a packet filter in mind. It was instruction set for packet filtering. Whereas the extended one came as a generic infrastructure to extend the kernel. That's a fundamental difference. How we extended it? Uh, the development began uh, late 2011. The first version was just in USA. Uh, instruction set architecture, and little known fact that first verifier was was operating on reduced x86 instruction set. Uh, we've hacked GCC to reduce the number of things x86 can generate, but that didn't go quite well because, well, for various reasons. At the end, we just said, no, screw that. That doesn't not going to work since it's x86 really only, and we would need to run on all architectures. So we reused only opcode encoding from the classic BPF, widened the register, did some other modification, and then it started to look like classic uh, instruction set, yet it's still vastly different. So uh, at the end, it looks more similar to x86 than to anything else, with uh, input from all other architectures are taken into the account, where uh, x86 ASA and ARM64 ASA were weighted the most in terms of influence to the BPF instruction set, but 
quirks of x86 were removed, like 16 and 8-bit sub-registers. Uh, BPF has only suited two to better match with ARM64, and certain things were like removed as well. Uh, we had the GC backend. It's still partially alive, and uh, some folks were interested in upstreaming it, but it never happened because of lack of the assembler, whereas LVM had an integrated assembler, so that's why the whole thing was upstreamed in LVM since 2015. Uh, went through quite a few versions and the changes, and the first version of the VPF in the kernel landed in 2014. So just reflecting back to it, that was four years, and when it happened, when BPF was sort of unleashed to the world, this is how it looked. Lots of new things, new toy, can probably do cool things with it, but there is no manual. Like People starting creating different things, and lots of really real, I would say, rocket ships were built. Uh, at the Facebook, we built Catran, Droplets, PVND, and a bunch of other things. Uh, I believe so far today only Catran um, is uh, open sourced. And uh, outside, for the, in the public repository, the tracing tools, a bunch of VC tools, uh, BPF trace uh, that's uh, still in a very, very active development, system time BPF, and many others. Uh, on the networking side, uh, Cilium is probably the biggest uh, open source project that leverages BPF in the networking space, uh, system deck in the tracing side, and many others. Because of this uh, green roots type of the approach, all of the ships uh, that were built, they kind of look the same. Once people figure out, let's say, Catron, how to use XDP uh, in an efficient way, everyone else started to like copy it. And the other solutions, like a droplet, they somewhat similar, similar to Catron. Uh, if you haven't heard of Catron, so this is uh, Facebook uh, production load balancer. It's key advantage versus uh, kernel bypass solutions that it's leveraging kernel stack at the same time. So on the same host, this is a picture on the right, uh, we run the SDP uh, in kernel packet processor that operates at the line speed and the same host uh, using standard Linux networking stack with uh, uh, what they call backend application that doing all sorts of other stuff. So uh, it's the all cores are equally loaded, and uh, this is not something you can do when you like completely bypass the stack, unless you start in doing like all sorts of extra hop between kernel and user space back and forth. So, as I was saying before, BPF. The main complaint for BPF today that it's hard to use. So. I keep asking the question myself, like, if it's hard, why would I use it? Uh, I think the answer to me is to build, to implement cool ideas that people have in mind, just user space solution is not enough. Kernel and user space need to work together to come up, to, to implement these this, this, uh, great ideas. This boundary of, control, of user space and control space, it's only well, it's only in the, in, in the people's mind. So we have to, the, what BPF made people realize that now we can blend this boundary, that the solution can be in both, both kernel space and user space. What was happening before when people thought that kernel cannot accommodate them, they either would develop a kernel module or completely bypass it. So bypass solutions is DPDK, obviously from Intel and SPDK, then the CLADB and C star technologies, then there is ODP and ARM, the SNAP switch, VPP from Cisco, then Google is doing the U-Haul uh, stuff and so on. Why? I think the answer is kernel is fundamentally hard to extend. So. That's why I strongly believe that kernel, the Linux kernel, needs BPF to stay relevant. How the programs look today? Uh, this is all the little helpers that one program we have to figure out how to use, glue them together, and create this nice. Uh, program that we can all use. These programs uh, are still loop-free, so this is a request that keep uh, coming 
uh, coming to us that we're going to address and log free. Log free meaning that uh, there is no uh, locking allowed. By design, the safety comes with the cost. We cannot just say, well, run everything in there. If we start, if we allowed loops from the very beginning, it was easy to make a mistake and create an endless loop. Kernel will hang and it would have no users. It would be no different from kernel modules. So as I was saying, the goal is safety first, then easy to use later. Easy to use, still work on it, but safety, that's why there are no loops, that's why there, there is no locking. And hooks, where you can attach it. This is hierarchy of the different hooks that today are uh, present in the Linux kernel. Uh, most of the tracing hooks here are uh, read-only in terms of what they can do with the kernel. Recently, we added error injection facility, which I think is pretty cool. So from the tracing hooks, we can modify the kernel behavior and inject fake uh, errors to check all the facilities. Uh, networking hook operated different layers. Like XZP is operating at the lowest uh, raw packet buffers before, uh, before the kernel stack, and sometimes the drivers can do anything with it. And one of the use cases, uh, let's say, for, for the XZP in some companies, what people call a big red button. When bad things are happening in the kernel, zero-day vulnerability is found. Uh, the the zero-day BPF prevention filtering program can be deployed quickly within hours across the fleet that will stop this attack. TC layer is uh, one above. Uh, lightweight tunneling is yet another layer above. Uh, reuse port is the newest addition where we can, um, in a smart way, do the load balancing across different sockets. Flow the sector is similar uh, security enforcement mechanism. But C group based hooks made the biggest impact uh, to the kernel and to VPF that uh, no one realized, especially Daniel, when he uh, implemented the first version of it. Uh, now it's uh, the fastest growing set of hooks, I would say. Uh, initially, it was just uh, layer three hooks for uh, ingress and ingress. Then we added uh, bind connect, UDP send message, socket create, uh, device controlling hooks. SOC map is a special one that's uh, not well known, but if you uh, hopefully saw the presentation from uh, Thomas Graf earlier today, SOC map is a hook that's used by uh, Kavalin to implement really, really fast socket redirect between different applications at uh, layer 7. And another set is uh, TCP BPF that are somewhat different from the other hooks. They act in on uh, uh, at runtime instead of instead of compile time, and with them we can fine tune. Their main purpose is to fine tune uh, congestion algorithms, uh, TCP congestion algorithms, for cases that congestion algorithm cannot express. For example, in a data center, you would have a different uh, mean RTT if your destination server uh, within Iraq or if it's in a different data center. In TCP, you cannot really express. So if you're a big company like Google, you can have a proprietary patches that understand uh, how IP, ha IP addresses are created and use that. Or you can use TCP VPF to give this extra knowledge to the kernel how to fine tune the TCP stack for the most optimal throughput. So these are more details. I guess I will skip all of this. The helpers. Yeah, not that interesting. There's a lot of it. A lot of it, and the stuff is uh, keep, keep being added. Um, yeah, <laughs> just a lot. So uh, the one uh, that's still probably the biggest, uh, well, obstacle, and uh, the, that uh, some of the BPF users uh, hate the most is, is a verifier. What they, what they say is they, to write a program, they need to constantly fight verifier to let the program be accepted. Uh, so that's unfortunately exactly the case uh, today. Um, but what happened recently that 
which only realizing today. Uh, about uh, six months six months ago, we introduced BPF to BPF calls, when within one program we can have different sub functions and create JIT dysfunctions as independent kernel function with arbitrary arguments and arbitrary return value. And we were able to teach Verifier to understand this call graph of different programs with arbitrary pointers that being passed between these different functions. So just imagine from before we were before, we had programs with a fixed context that was like a SKB pointer and return like single integer. And that was the scope of verification. From this, we went to arbitrary graph of functions with arbitrary pointers passed between each other. When we just when we started implementing the verifier, it like just really seemed impossible. Like this is non-tractable problem, but we made it, and we believe we still believe that it is safe. So this changed the changed the mind of the developers. So what we're going right now, uh, Joe uh, from Cavelli now adding the. Uh, pointer tracking, let's say, primitives to the, to the verifier. So we'll be able to do unthinkable things before. Like uh, the first use case is to return a socket uh, by the helper. So both from XDP and the TC layer on the networking stack, we can uh, look up a socket that's uh, controlled by the bigger networking stack, we return it back to the program. And the verifier will make sure that the, the program will release it back to the kernel because of reference counting. It will make sure that this, this pointer does not leak, that we don't accidentally like, return and so on. So it analyzes the both control flow and the data flow of the program, tracking all the pointers, and making sure that the program is valid from this data flow perspective. Like, I would say some of the uh, standalone static analysis tools do this as well. Most of the compilers do not because they don't care. Like it doesn't matter. Like from optimization performance stand standpoint of view, static tools do. But doing this in the kernel, that's pretty revolutionary. One, it, it's very close to land. I hope it was would be landing today, but hopefully it will land like a few days from now. So the patch is practically ready. Uh, what it will allow us to do is to introduce malloc functionality to allocate and free object from the BPF program and make sure that we don't leak memory. Just just imagine how cool is that to have a safe memory allocation, lock on lock. So before we couldn't do like spin lock, like all the programs they in one uh, non preemptable section in one RCU section. Preempt disable and RCU lock is done outside of the program because we couldn't track this. Now, with this functionality, with these smart bits that being added to the verifier, we can reduce the RCU section. We can do RCU inside the program. We can do like spin locks and whatever else. So this is huge. But more coming. Loops are the hardest to do. And well, technically, we, I believe the terminating halting problem is what undecidable. We're going to solve it too. Uh, with conditions, of course. Uh, there are two proposals uh, from Covalent and uh, SolarFlare folks. Uh, we've been baking them for about a year now, trying to decide which is the long term, um, long term going to work. Both actually have the pl pluses and minuses, and not in the shape yet to uh, merge upstream. But the work is continuing it, so and everyone is pushing hard. So hopefully next year, when we have an Excel systems go, we'll come and say, look, you can do loops now. But that's not it again. So um, Lawrence is, we have, uh, oh, well, we discussed the indirect calls. So basically the tail call stuff uh, that, um, well, anyway, so there, there's, there's so much stuff that's, that's going on right now. This is just a short list of the features that uh, different companies uh, and different people are working on. All of them, I think, equally cool. Uh, different use cases for each. This is, this is coming. At the end, 
today we have this uh, crutch inside the verifier that's doing that's only allowing 128 instructions in one program, and the program is limited to 4,000. Why was it the case? We couldn't do anything better. We just did uh, 4K because that was the limit for the classic, and 128 because we increased it like five times. Uh, that's how it was. So now we're getting bold, and the next target is to get to the 1 million instructions. So the programs will not be your small log-free, loop-free programs, but something big that the real Rubik's, Rubik's Cube algorithm will be expressible in it. I do mean it. That will happen. <laughs> But that's not it. So still more, more, more to go. Uh, another pain point is of use, as I said. BPF gets its performance from JIT. As folks who try to debug Java or Node.js know that doing performance analysis for JIT languages is pain in the butt. In kernel with BPF, it's even harder because JIT is done by the kernel, not by user space. So if it was user space, user space can tell the performance tools the association between JIT code and original when the kernel disassociation is lost. What kernel runs pretty much has nothing to do with the code that was written initially. So we need to bridge this gap and keep association all the way from source code, through the instructions, through all the optimizations that the kernel does to the JITs, all the death, everything the JIT does, and tie it all together, return it back, so we can finally do proper performance analysis and improve the debuggability. So type information is coming, uh, source line information, function prototypes, and many other things. So type information we're doing through what we call a BTF. Uh, it stands for BTF type format. Uh, pieces of it already landed. Uh, the most interesting bit will be when we start uh, converting VM Linux and embedding uh, BTF time info inside the VM Linux, it will add the extra step. Currently, dwarf for VM Linux is about 300 megabytes. The BTF is currently, currently 10, so it's what uh, 30x reduction, but still too high. Our target is uh, reduce it down to one, one megabyte only. Uh, but uh, this compression currently takes five minutes. Not acceptable. So once we get to seconds uh, runtime and one megabyte, then we'll get it uh, get it upstream. Uh, C group local storage is another. We're still in ideas, obviously, from user space. User space had uh, thread local storage for years. Um, why not to do it in the kernel? So our first uh, uh, Local storage is a uh, C-group local storage that Roman implemented. We have two flavors, just a regular one and per CPU. What it does is same same as in user space. It avoids extra lookups and adds uh, performance. For And in kernel, we obviously care about zero, zero overhead. And with this, I'm out of time. So to recap what we've talked about, BPF in the future will be safe and will be easy to write. <laughs> Thank you. Please ask questions. Yes. Yeah, I, can. I will read. Uh, how about uh, some real time? Because you were mentioning safety. Mm -hmm. And uh, in some fields, uh, safety means um, real time and determinism. And yes. um, considering also the JIT step, uh, is there some idea of how to evaluate the uh, determinism, the, so the real time properties of these programs? Uh, so the, the JIT part is done during the load, so it's not, uh, so yeah, so JIT is probably wrong word, and it always rubs me in the wrong place when I say JIT, is, uh, because JIT 
to me as a compiler engineer by background is just in time. So BPF is not doing just in time actually. It's doing it's converting BPF instructions into native uh, assembler at the load time. So it's it doesn't add to the runtime cost at all. So whatever time it takes to verify the program and JIT it is done in a user user context and charged by the the time is charged to the process that uh, doing the load. So the only real time cost that can affect the real time is the final execution of the program. And the final execution is currently limited by these 4,000 instructions. If it's used in the wrong place, yes, it will start uh, adding up. Like, if we constantly doing, I don't know, 20 hash table lookups for every packet, yes, the network and processing will be slower. So, this unavoidable to some, to some degree. We have few ideas how to uh, automatically mitigate even, mm -hmm. even such, such scenarios, but uh, so far, it's too many cool ideas to do and not enough people to implement them. But this is definitely in on to-do list. Okay, thanks. So with BPF to BPF calls, you introduce the possibility of uh, like uh, indefinite recursion. So do you tr aim to detect this by analyzing the call graph and not allowing yeah. loops, or do you just limit the stack size? Or yes, how is it's, it's both. It's, doing, it's checking for recursions that calls don't uh, call back into each other, and it's checking the maximum call stack that uh, each uh, function takes. So the current, so initial stack, stack size limit was 512 bytes. It's still the same even for multiple functions. But majority of the functions, they don't need 512 bytes, so they just like call each other until it's reaches 512. And so there are, there are a bunch of, bunch of, bunch of this, uh, well, to some degree artificial limits. Like the, num the nested number of calls currently is eight, I think, but this number just like picked arbitrary. Like why not, why eight? Just because. Why 512 bytes? Well, kernel is probably okay if we consume 512 bytes, especially if some functions are assuming two kilobytes. And the static analyzer is able to do this, or is that a runtime failure then? That's static analysis. Like all of this is done by static static analysis by the verifier. The only runtime check we currently have is a tail call limit. Tail call actually can be recursive, and tail calls uh, limited to 32. 32, yes. Um, so for all of these new things that you mentioned, what's the best? I'm unmuted. Um, I'm speaking into the microphone. Okay, cool. Um, what's the best way to keep up with all of the cool stuff that's happening in BPF world? Like, uh, except bug you, maybe. Uh, obviously, I attend all systems go. <laughs> but. <laughs> Uh, seri well, both seriously, and uh, it's an ex excellent question. Um, right now, we're spinning up a website uh, the, on the Facebook, and there will be a blog there. So we will try to keep uh, track of posting all the latest news, news there, um, and following the networking mailing list, I guess. But it's an excellent question. Oh, yeah, advisor meetings, yes, we have bi-weekly calls where we discuss all of this stuff. It's public, public. Anyone, anyone free to attend? Yeah, it's pretty much BVF call. We still call it I advisor, but yeah. That's not recorded, right? It's not recorded, no. The light is off. Uh, do you see a use, do you see a case for a set Check. of common BPF programs that live perhaps in the kernel source code or something very close to it as opposed to passing them around on GitHub from project yes. to project as we discover yes. bugs in our that's, TCP that's, dissectors? Yes, that's what I uh, sort of briefly, very briefly skipped here. Libraries. So that's exactly what it is. It's uh, we want to like push some of the stuff that just lives in the kernel and common primitives will just be there. Yes. 
Um, uh, uh, one question, like the, the, like the Solaris um, uh, tracing stuff, it has its own language, right? Yes. Uh, BPF um, is currently only like machine code kind of thing, right? And now you have this scheme as you, that you can use LLVM to also generate it. In that case, um, most you would write the programs in something that resembles C, right? But do you have any um, idea where you want to go with this? Like, do you expect that there is um, a somewhat accepted standard language for writing BPF rules later that is that is C or is it not C? Or uh -huh. that you want to yeah. do any kind of tool set? Or do you expect that um, this is other, up for like third-party people mm -hmm. um, who want to write their own tools with their own languages? What's what's the plan? Excellent. So I, I love this question. <laughs> there is so much in it to me. Uh, because like the philosophy of the VPF is to be this the construction set and let everyone build on top, including the languages. Why I strongly push C from the very beginning because of ease of use. Everyone knows C, so let's make C work as well as it could. At the same time, we're trying to enable everyone as well. Like BPF Trace is a project that has -tra pretty much DTrace like language, like DTrace minus minus, DTrace syntax that doesn't generate any C. It generates LVM IR and feeds into LVM backend directly. That's one project. Then there is another project called Ply, P L Y. It also has DTrace like language, but it generates uh, BPF instructions directly without any LVM. So it's best suited for embedded environment. Uh, then there is another project that takes Python and generates, looks at the Python internal representations, generates BPF codes without any LVM just based on Python IR. So all of this is blooming and growing, and there will be new languages. We constantly have like uh, discussions uh, that we need to hire a language designer to design a language for VPF. It may happen one day. But the way it looks, the C one is definitely the one that's going to be uh, supported by upstream, and hence probably has an edge over the others, right? Yes. <laughs> I'm biased just a little bit towards C. <laughs> okay, I have a question. It's me. Oh, yes. So, um, so BPF to BPF calls, and you said that they are now being uh, verified by the verifier, uh, and you can do the call graph analysis also. So, what if you give input like as a massive, uh, as a program which generates like a massive call graph? And if this analysis is done inside the kernel, how yes. are you going to handle that? You mean the concern that it somehow will take yeah, well, the verifier, infinite amount uh, of time? Yeah, verifier runs it's, out of time. Do you have a limit to that? Yes, yeah, so it has the limit of, that's this crunch, what I call the limit of 192 instructions. So even if the whole program is like 4,000 instructions long, if it sees that this, this complexity is exploding, it will reach 100. 192, and we'll say, uh, I give up. So this is course way to prevent the uh, ugly programs from consuming too much CPU time during verification. Hey, so um, when I try to use uh, BPF for like uh, debugging, um, one, one challenge that I, I experience is that because probably because I'm not used to it, is that when um, the program compiles and it gets unloaded, then kernel rejects the verifier rejects it. But it was kind of really difficult to what the verifier says to my code. Are there like plans to improve uh, in that area? Yes, so ease of use is understood. It's uh, not easy today. And yes, the people constantly fight verifier. And that's exactly, yes. So today from the code, whether it's C or DTrace language or whatever else, when the verifier says, oh, these instructions you load in from an uninitialized memory, most of the time users have no idea why this assembler instruction, where it corresponds to. So this step, type, infor type information and source life line information that we're currently very actively working on is exactly to address that. But we first we thought that we'll just do line number information the way that typical user space application do. We decided to go a step further and we'll just like push pieces of the source uh, in, the, in the kernel. So there, the verifier can say, like, this piece of original code is, like, misbehaving. Look for the bug there.
Okay, I'm guess some. Oh, okay, one more question, and we're out of time. Hello. What's the most difficult thing uh, to do as a maintainer of BPF? The most difficult thing is to say no. Uh, when there are so many cool things are happening, and the most difficult is to figure out the balance of the... Uh, n to not get too much into specific um, niche that doesn't that will prevent uh, the core from growing faster. It's I can give like more specific example, but that's that's to me is the hardest. Thank you.